Hi guys, today I am frantically trying to get this done, which is talk through the AQA Chemistry Paper 1 from May 2018. It's actually the day before the 2019 paper. I just realised this went live on the AQA website. I don't know when, but I realised it was there yesterday. So I'm going to try my absolute best to get through it today, if I have enough time. So we'll see how we get on. So question 1. Soluble salts are formed by reacting metal oxides with acids. Give one other type of substance that can react with an acid to form a soluble salt. A nice question to get started on. You've got lots of options here. Make sure that you obviously don't mention the option they've already given you, which is metal oxide. So you could actually state metal hydroxide, metal, metal carbonate. It's up to you, or even an alkali. But don't repeat the one they've given you in the question. Two, calcium nitrate contains the ions Ca2 plus and NO3 minus. Give the formula of calcium nitrate. So you could do the swap and drop thing, or you could do the method I prefer, which is to have a look at the ions and work out what the problem is. Well, you can't shove those together directly because calcium has a two plus charge and nitrate only has a one minus charge. So if I draw a second nitrate ion, I can see that those charges are now equal. And so I just need to acknowledge that second nitrate by using brackets and a small two. The brackets are essential because the two applies to both the nitrogen and the oxygen. Describe a method to make pure dry crystals of magnesium sulfate from a metal oxide and a dilute acid. Six marks. Okay, wow, well, we're getting straight stuck into the difficult stuff now. This is a soluble salt, and you just need to list a load of method points in order to get the six marks. So let's first of all state what we need, because they've just said a metal oxide and a dilute acid, but we know we're making magnesium sulfate. So in the first step, use magnesium oxide and sulfuric acid so we've named the correct reagents and now we'll get into the steps so add sulfuric acid to a beaker and warm then add I'm not going to keep writing out obviously write it out if you want to but I'll use the formula then add the magnesium oxide and stir. Crucially, you need to add the magnesium oxide until it's in excess. Once you've done that, you want to filter to remove any undissolved magnesium oxide. And let's add a point as to how we're doing that. So we're using filter paper and a funnel. Then we want to heat the remaining solution in an evaporating basin. Before leaving to cool. And then lastly, we want to dry our crystals on filter paper. I think I've said about 10 marks worth of stuff. So just be very specific with the type of reagent we're using and then give a very easy to follow step-by-step -step approach as to how we're going to make this soluble salt. Two, this question is about metals and metal compounds. Iron pyrites is an ionic compound. Figure one shows the structure for iron pyrites. Determine the formula of iron pyrites. So have a look at what we've got going on here. The big black ones are iron. The small grey ones are sulphur. There's two of them. When you write a formula, the metal always comes first, which is why the formula is FeS2. An atom of iron is represented as 5626 Fe. Give the number of protons, neutrons and electrons in this atom of iron. Use your periodic table to show you this, and that, that is the atomic number. 56, the top number is the mass number. Remember that the atomic number equals the proton number, which equals the electron number, whereas the mass number is equal to protons plus neutrons. So according to my notes, therefore, the number of protons is 26, number of electrons is 26. To work out the number of neutrons, we need to do 56 minus 26 
to get 30. Iron is a transition metal. Sodium is a group one metal. Give two differences between the properties of iron and sodium. Hopefully you remember that iron is a very regular metal. It's malleable, it's ductile, it's strong, it's hard. It has high melting points. However, sodium is strange because it's in group one. It means it reacts incredibly readily with water. It's soft. It has a low melting point. So just specify any of those. So let's say that iron has a higher melting point than sodium. Secondly, iron is stronger than sodium. And I've written a nice comparison. Nickel is extracted from nickel oxide by reduction with carbon. Explain why carbon can be used to extract nickel from nickel oxide. Hopefully you realise this is all to do with the reactivity series and it's because carbon is more reactive than nickel. And can therefore displace the oxygen. Two part five. An equation for the reaction is nickel oxide plus carbon forms nickel plus carbon monoxide. Calculate the percentage atom economy for the reaction to produce nickel. Give your answer to three sig fig. Okay, let's make sure we do that. So percentage atom economy. Let's write the equation, is the MR of the useful product over the MR of the reactants times by 100. So we're looking to produce nickel, so we need our MR of nickel, which is 59. The MR of the reactants is nickel oxide, which we've been told is 75, plus carbon which is 12 and we want to multiply that by 100 so when you pop that into your calculator you get a value which is 67.8 percent to three sig fig chemical reactions can produce electricity figure two shows a simple cell which of these combinations would not give a zero reading on the voltmeter in figure two so effectively they're asking which combination would actually work so first of all, copper, copper wouldn't work because they are the same metal. They have the same reactivity and for the same reason, zinc and zinc wouldn't work. And then in the last two options, we've got both copper and zinc as the electrodes. So that sounds good. We now need to focus in on the electrolyte. Now you need a substance which dissolves into ions in order for this to work, which is why we need sodium chloride solution. So option three is the correct answer here. Alkaline batteries are non-rechargeable. Why do alkaline batteries eventually stop working? And that's because a reactant is used up. And once it's gone, the battery can no longer work. Part three, why can alkaline batteries not be recharged? And that's because the reaction involved is not reversible. Hydrogen fuel cells and rechargeable lithium ion batteries can be used to power electric cars. Complete the balanced equation for the overall reaction in a hydrogen fuel cell. So we know we are having hydrogen reacting with oxygen. Remember it's diatomic, so it's O2. I've got two oxygens on the left hand side, only one on the right, so I'm going to put a two here. And now I have four hydrogens on the right hand side, only two on the left hand side, so I need a two here. Check out my video on balancing equations if you don't like the inspection method. Table 1 shows data about different ways to power electric cars. So we're comparing hydrogen fuel cells with rechargeable lithium ion batteries. Time taken to refuel or recharge in minutes. Hydrogen fuel cells only 5 minutes. Rechargeable ion batteries 30 minutes. So hydrogen fuel cell wins here. Distance travel before refueling or recharging in miles hydrogen fuel cell up to 415 rechargeable lithium 240 so hydrogen wins again distance traveled per units of energy in kilometers hydrogen only 22 rechargeable lithium beats it at 66 
cost of refueling or recharging in pounds? 50 pounds, wow. Hydrogen fuel cells are really expensive. The lithium iron is much cheaper. Minimum cost of a car in pounds, 60,000 pounds to buy hydrogen fuel cell. Okay, so again, the lithium iron battery is much cheaper and therefore wins. Evaluate the use of hydrogen fuel cells compared with rechargeable lithium iron batteries to power electric cars. Use table one and your own knowledge. It's worth six marks. This is quite a nice question because an awful lot of, of information has been included. So let's start by stating what we can see in the table. So we can say that the time taken to refuel hydrogen fuel cell is much faster than the lithium iron next up the distance traveled is much greater So we've said the two main advantages of the hydrogen fuel cell, so now I'm going to add my own um, knowledge. So for then hydrogen fuel cells do not release greenhouse gases. And only have, let's look at that equation. water as a byproduct. Coupled with this, the lithium iron battery may release toxic chemicals on its disposal. So we've talked about lots of advantages with hydrogen fuel cells. Now we're going to focus in on the disadvantages. So the distance, however, the distance traveled per, let's just check the wording, per unit of energy is much less for the hydrogen fuel cell. The cost of the vehicle is much greater. What was the last point? as is the cost of refueling. So I'm confident that I have given six separate points there, so I'm going to stop there. Four, figure three represents different models of the atom. Which diagram shows the plum pudding model of the atom? So remember Thompson's plum pudding, looks like a spherical cookie really, made up of a sponge which is positive charge and then the Plums were supposed to be electrons. So let's have a look. Which model most closely represents that? That would be B. Which diagram shows the model of the atom developed from the alpha particle scattering experiment? So in Rutherford's experiment, he basically proved the existence of a very small nucleus surrounded by shells of electrons. And he didn't actually realise that the shells were evenly spaced, which is why C is the answer as opposed to A. Which diagram shows the model of the atom resulting from Bohr's work? Well, Bohr showed that the electrons were present in shells at equal distances away from the nucleus, which is why A is the answer here. To find the mass number of an atom, so the mass number is the total number 
of protons and neutrons. found in the nucleus. Element X has two isotopes. Their mass numbers are 69 and 71. The percentage abundance of each isotope is 60% of 69X, 40% of 71X. Estimate the relative atomic mass of element X. Okay, this is a weirdly asked question, but what I'm gonna do is just work it out and then see which answer most closely matches. So I do their percentage times their mass number over 100 to get 69.8. And which of those four options would 69.8 fit into? Well, it's this one. Chadwick's experiment work on the atom led to a better understanding of isotopes. Explain how his work led to this understanding. Remember, his work provided evidence for the presence of neutrons. And then for the second mark, really just for the second and third mark, really just state what an isotope is. So an isotope is atoms of the same element. Oops. With the same number of protons. but a different number of neutrons. Five, a student investigated the temperature change in displacement reactions between metals and copper sulfate solution. Table two shows the student's results. Plot the data from table two on figure four as a bar chart. And they've kindly labeled the axis for us. So I'm going to write my metals along the bottom And then let's pick a sensible scale. So we need to occupy as much of the graph paper as possible. So I'm going to go from 0 through to 45. And do check your axes and make sure that everything's evenly spaced. Then it's just a matter of plotting it. So the temperature increase in degrees Celsius for copper was zero so I can't write anything there. For iron it was 13 use your ruler here rather than a shaky iPad hand. For magnesium it was 43 and then for zinc it was 17 5.2. The student concluded that the reactions between the metals and copper sulfate solution are endothermic. Give one reason why this conclusion is not correct. Okay, so remember that endothermic reactions get cold, whereas we've been told up here that the temperature increases, which means this reaction is exothermic. So just write the temperature increased. So the reaction must be exothermic. The temperature change depends on the reactivity of the metal. The student's results are used to place copper, iron and magnesium and zinc in order of their reactivity. Describe a method to find the position of an unknown metal in this reactivity series. Your method should give valid results, so really we want to list some control variables. Now they'll accept a whole variety of methods, but I'm going to use the one which they've basically mentioned. So I'm going to add the unknown metal to copper sulfate. And measure the temperature change because obviously 
If it is higher than 43, then it will be more reactive than magnesium, and you can basically slot it in based on the temperature increase. Now, I will control the following variables. So I'm now making this valid. I will use the same concentration and volume of copper sulfate. I will use the same mass and surface area of metal. So I'm making sure that I'm definitely scoring those marks for validity. 5.4, draw a fully labelled reaction profile for the reaction between zinc and copper sulphate solution in, on figure 5. So I already told you this is exothermic, which means that the energy change is negative, which actually means that the reactants have more energy than the products. So what does that look like? It means that the reactants have to start at a higher energy than the products, so I'm going to label them reactants, products. You need to show the activation energy, which is from the reactants to the top of the peak. And we need to show the overall energy change, which is from the top of the peak to the products. And as you can see, this decreases, which is why delta H is negative and it's an exothermic reaction. Six, as Shun investigated the electrolysis of different substances, figure six shows the apparatus. Explain why electrolysis would not take place in the apparatus shown in figure six. So what are the issues? Well, graphite electrodes are good, crucible's fine. The issue here is the solid zinc chloride. So we need to say that because the zinc chloride is solid, the ions are not free to move. Don't talk about electrons here, it's a giant ionic structure, so we need to talk about ions. So no electricity can be conducted. Explain why graphite conducts electricity. Answer in terms of the structure and bonding in graphite. So graphite is a giant covalent structure whereby each carbon atom is bonded to three others. Meaning that the fourth electron is free to move. or delocalised if we're feeling fancy and can carry the charge. The shoot investigated how the volume of gases produced changes with time in the electrolysis of sodium chloride solution. Figure 7 shows the apparatus. Notice that we're looking for volume of gases here. So we have our test tubes which are filled with chlorine and hydrogen sodium chloride solution and the graphite electrodes. The student made an error in selecting the apparatus for this investigation. How should the apparatus be changed and give one reason for your answer? So it's because she's after looking at the volume of gases and test tubes will not give you any indication of volume. So she should swap the test tubes for measuring cylinders. because you can't measure volume using test tubes. A 
another student used the correct apparatus, this student measured the volumes of gases collected every minute for 20 minutes. Figure 8 shows the student's results. Describe the trends shown in the results and use values from figure 8. Three marks, so we're going to have to say quite a lot here. So first of all, as time increases, the volume of gas collected increases. And you can see from the shape of the graph that this is a directly proportional relationship. And now we need to be really specific and actually calculate some rates of reaction. And remember, we do that by working out the amount of gas collected and dividing it by the time taken. So let's do that for hydrogen. So we need to do change in Y, which is 9 over change in X, which is 20. So 9 divided by 20 equals 0 0.45 centimetres cubed per minute. And then have another look at the graph. You can basically see that the gradients are identical for hydrogen and chlorine for most parts. So you can say that after, let's work out where it changes, it's here, after eight minutes. the rate of collection of hydrogen and chlorine is the same. Six point five. The number of moles of each gas produced at the electrodes is the same. No gas escapes from the apparatus. Suggests one reason for the difference in volume of each gas collected. So we need to try and wonder what happened to some of the gas if it didn't escape. And really, it's because chlorine is soluble in water, so some of it dissolves. And therefore, its reading will be less. Calculate the amount in moles of chlorine collected after 20 minutes. Use figure 8. The volume of one mole of any gas at room temperature and pressure is 24 decimeters cubed. Give your answer in standard form. Okay, lots to look at here. So after 20 minutes, let's read across for chlorine. And we can see that that is 6.3. Sorry, 6.6. .6, I can't read. So volume of chlorine is 6.6 .6 centimeters cubed. We need to convert that to decimeters cubed by dividing it by a thousand. That's messy. Perfect. And then lastly, look, one mole of any gas at room temperature and pressure is 24 decimeters cubed. And we have 6.6 .6 times 10 to the minus 3. So all you have to do now to work out the number of moles is do 6.6 .6 times 10 to the minus 3 divided by 24 to get 2.75 times 10 to the minus 4. And they want us to leave it in standard form, so that's nice. We're just going to write that answer in. 7. This question is about group 7 elements. Chlorine is more reactive than iodine. Name the products formed when chlorine reaction. Chlorine solution reacts with potassium iodide solution. So we've got this situation going on. Because chlorine is more reactive, it displaces the iodine to become potassium chloride plus iodide. So we need to name both products. So we have potassium chloride. And iodine. Explain why chlorine is more reactive than iodine. So if you look in the periodic table, you'll find that within group seven, that chlorine is higher. So chlorine is therefore smaller and has fewer shells of electrons.
This means that chlorine's out for electrons are closer to the nucleus. and more tightly attracted. By the way, all these sorts of answers are in my revision guide, which you can find on the Science with Hazel website. It is therefore easier to gain an electron, which is basically why it's more reactive. Chlorine reacts with hydrogen to form hydrogen chloride. Explain why hydrogen chloride is a gas at room temperature. Answer in terms of structure and bonding. This is a chemical structures question. It's asking you to identify effectively what type of structure hydrogen chloride is. Is it giant ionic, giant metallic, giant covalent, simple molecular? Well, the fact that it's a gas at room temperature means that it's a simple molecular. So HCl is a simple molecular structure. And then we just wrote learn the perfect answer for this again in my revision guides. So it is a simple molecular structure with weak intermolecular forces. Which require little energy to break. So always state the amount of energy needed to break the forces. Seven point four. Bromine reacts with methane in sunlight. Figure nine shows the displayed formula for the reaction of bromine with methane. Table three shows the bond energies and the overall energy change in the reaction. Calculate the bond energy X for the CBr bond. Okay, this is actually quite hard. So let's do the equation. So bonds broken. Take away bonds formed. Equals overall energy change. So let's see what bonds have been broken. So one, two, three, four. Four lots of CH. So four times four, one, two, plus one BR. So that's the first side. Minus bonds formed. So three lots of CH. plus CBR, which is what we're after, which is why that's plus X, plus HBR, which is 366. And we know that equals minus 51. So we now need to tidy it all up. So let's sort out four times 412 plus 193. And when you do that, you get 1,841. We'll sort out this bit of the equation too. So when you've collected that all together, you get 1,602 plus x equals minus 51. And then if we sort that out a bit further, so we do 1,841 minus 1,602 to get 239 plus x equals minus 51. To get x by itself, you have to take away 239 from both sides. And you get 290. Well, it's minus 290, but we can't have a negative bond energy, so we'll just turn that into positive. Eight, titanium is a transition metal. Titanium is extracted from titanium dioxide in a two-stage industrial process. Suggest one hazard associated with stage one. Okay, lots of hazards here. We've got chlorine gas and carbon monoxide both of which are pretty unpleasant. I'm just going to state that carbon monoxide is toxic. Um, as you know from the organic chemistry crude oil topic, water must be kept away from the reaction. In stage two, give one reason why it would be hazardous if water came into contact with sodium. Remember that sodium is very reactive, so sodium would react very violently with water. Remember, sodium is so reactive that it will react with the water in your hand. So, yeah, don't want to be touching that, really. Suggest why the reaction in stage 2 is carried out in an atmosphere of argon and not in air. 
Okay, so argon, remember, is a noble gas. So argon is very unreactive. And air, remember, contains oxygen. So oxygen would be reacting if we were allowed to carry out this experiment in air. Eight point four. Titanium chloride is a liquid at room temperature. Explain why you would not expect titanium chloride to be a liquid at room temperature. Yay, another chemical structures question. So we have a metal and a non-metal, which means we have a ionic structure. So titanium chloride is a giant ionic structure. With strong electrostatic forces of attraction between oppositely charged ions which require a lot of energy to break. This means it has a high melting point, helping explain why it's not a liquid at room temperature. In stage two, sodium displaces titanium from titanium chloride. Sodium atoms are oxidized to sodium ions in this reaction. Why is this an oxidation reaction? So it tells us we're going from sodium atoms to sodium ions, which means to go from an atom to a positively charged ions, it must have lost electrons. And remember all your rig. Oxidation is loss of electrons, reduction is gain. Complete the half equation for the oxidation reaction. Oops, I've already done that. 8.7. In stage 2, 40 kilograms of titanium chloride was added to 20 kilograms of sodium. The equation for the reaction is, explain why titanium chloride is the limiting reactant. You must show you're working. Okay, this is quite a hard more calculation. So, you know me, I love drawing tables. So I always start, it kind of relaxes me because I know where to get going. And we know that we have 40 kilograms of titanium chloride. Now, what you have to do when you're looking for the limiting reactant is work out the theoretical mass that you would produce of one of the reactants and compare it to the other number that they've given you and see if it's more or less. So I'll show you what I mean. So I'm gonna write 40 kilograms of titanium chloride into my table. The MR I'm going to work out from the numbers I've been given. So 48 plus 35.5 times 4 gives me an MR of 190. And then to work out the number of moles, we need this triangle which states that number of moles is mass divided by MR. So I'm going to do 40 divided by 190 to get a number of moles which is 0 0.2105. Now I'm going to have a look at the mole connection which is here, it's one to four. So I need to multiply that number by four to work out the number of moles of sodium. And once I've done that, I get 0 0.842. Let's now work out the MR of sodium. So that's just 23 as given here. So now we're gonna work out the theoretical mass of sodium based on that 40 kilograms of titanium chloride. So all I have to do here is look at my formula triangle Mass is MR times number of moles. So when I multiply that together, I get 19.4 kilograms. And now I need to compare 19.4 kilograms with the actual amount I was provided with. Well, I was actually provided with 20 kilograms of sodium. So more sodium, which means that titanium chloride must be the limiting reactant. Okay. 
and it doesn't matter if you'd started with titanium chloride or with sodium and compared the other way as long as you prove look 19.4 is less than 20 kilograms which we were actually provided with for a stage two reaction the percentage yield was 92.3 percent the theoretical maximum mass of titanium produced in this batch was 13.5 kilograms calculate the actual mass of titanium produced another upside down calculation so remember percentage yield is given by actual yield over theoretical yield times by 100 so therefore we know that the percentage yield was 92.3 we're looking for the actual mass so that's x and the theoretical was 13.5. So we just need to solve this maths equation first of all by getting rid of that multiplied by 100 by dividing both sides by 100 to get 0 0.923 equals x over 13.5. To get x by itself we times both sides by 13.5 to get x equals 12.5. Nine, this question is about acids and alkalis. Dilute hydrochloric acid is a strong acid. Explain why an acid can be described as both strong and dilute. So two marks, so we need to say two separate points. Strong acids fully ionize or dissociate in solution. And then dilute acids contain a small amount of acid in a particular volume. At 1.0 times 10 to the minus 3 moles dm cubed solution of HCl has a pH of 3. What is the pH of a 1 times 10 to the minus 5 mole per dm cubed solution of HCl? Let's just compare the small numbers here. So it's gotten less concentrated and it's effectively gone from 10 to the minus 3 to 10 to the minus 4, which increases the pH by 1. And then from 10 to the minus 4 to 10 to the minus 5, which increases the pH by 2. So it's becoming more alkali effectively. So therefore, the pH will be 5 we've gone from 4 to 5. A student titrated 25 centimeters cubed portions of dilute sulfuric acid with 0 0.105 moles per dm cubed sodium hydroxide solution. The equation for the reaction is calculate the concentration of sulfuric acid, use only the student's concordant results. And we're told that concordant results are those within 0 0.1 centimetres cubed of each other. So we definitely need to find this volume of hydroxide solution that we're going to use. We need to identify the concordant results. So one's within 0 0.1 centimetres cubed of each other. This one's far too high. This one's far too low. And these are all within 0 0.1 of each other. So just add them up and divide by 3 to work out your volume that we're going to be using, which is 22.13. Now we're ready to get going with our titration calculation, effectively. So as always, write out the equation again, make sure you're copying it correctly. We're using a table, but this time with N, C and B. This is how I always set up my calculations. So now start substituting in information you've been given. We're looking for the concentration of sulfuric acid, so that's here, X. We've been told that the concentration of sodium hydroxide solution is 0 0.105. We've been told that the volume of sulfuric acid is 25 centimetres cubed. Remember, we need to convert that into decimetres cubed by dividing by 1,000. Now the volume of sodium hydroxide, I've just worked that out up here, it's 22.13. And again, I need to divide by 1,000 to convert that to dm cubed. And now I'm ready to go, really, because I can see straight away that I can work out the number of moles of sodium hydroxide. So I do concentration times volume, so 0 0.105 times 22.13 over 1,000 to get a number of moles of 2.32 times 10 to the minus 3. 
check the mole connection, so it's two to one. So I effectively take that number I've just calculated and divide by two to find out the number of moles of sulfuric acid to get 1.161 times 10 to the minus three. And then finally, to work out the concentration, I just do number of moles divided by the volume. So 1.161 times 10 to the minus three divided by 25 over 1,000 and I get 0 0.0465. And that is the final answer. Explain why the student should use a pipette to measure the dilute sulfuric acid and a burette to measure the sodium hydroxide solution. That's because pipettes measure a fixed volume, which is what we need in this situation, whereas Burettes measure variable volumes, which is what we need for the sodium hydroxide Calculate the mass of sodium hydroxide in 30 centimetres cubed of a 0 0.105 mole per dm cubed solution. Okay, so we're going to use this triangle again. And actually, we're going to use this triangle too. So mass is MR times number of moles. So we can see that a common link between the two is that we need to find out the number of moles. So number of moles is concentration times volume. We've been told that the concentration is 0 0.105. The volume is 30. Divide it by 1,000 to get it into dm cubed. And once you've done that, you'll get 3.15 times 10 to the minus 3. And then finally, to find out the mass of sodium hydroxide. We need to do MR times number of moles. The MR we've been told is 40. The number of moles we've just worked out. Put that into your calculator and you'll get a value which is 0 0.126 grams. Whoa, that was a beast of a paper. I think I'm losing my voice. I really hope you found it helpful, guys. Good luck. You'll be brilliant. Stay focused. Make sure you answer every single question. So yeah, good luck. Let me know how it goes.